Hello and off we go for a special Showtime edition regarding the latest SIHH, kind of a prime time, yes I know this means rather long, be prepared, but thorough, inspired and opinionated. So the SIHH is a big big event and we're a pretty small team, meaning that it's quite difficult for us to produce individual vid video reports with all the brands participating in only 4 days. But there is more to that and in all honesty, sometimes, well, we simply don't have much to say about what we see, unfortunately. So this is why we are now coming up with this uh, big wrap up of the event, talk about the brands we didn't talk about, uh, not all of them of course, I mean i.e. please refer to the point just made, give some kind of uh, general opinion about the show itself, some of the trends witnessed and I would also share my selection of the very best watchers at the end of this video. And uh, let's say that overall this was a good edition, I mean one that deserves from the very start of this uh, video a celebrated and positive VIVA watchmaking! So ladies and gentlemen, hang in there, it's showtime! And to start up with, well let's talk about what has become the most talked subject of the show, monopolizing social media at large and general discussions among peers, but not necessarily for the good reasons. And you guessed it, but this was the launch of the, match, uh, of the new Audemars Piguet collection code 1159. The fact that AP wanted to develop a second line of watches and try to counterbalance the massive predominance of the Royal Oak and Royal Oak Offshore in its portfolio is of course a wise decision. And when I say, well, predominance, I mean a rumor 98% of the brand's turnover. So to benefit from the brand's super hot position among the most desired brand on the planet, and please remember that this is a very small club, I mean Richard Mille, Rolex, Patek, and so to serve this wave of success obviously really makes sense, but I don't think that it really worked as planned. Yes, kind of a slight understatement there. Okay, some might say that there is no bad publicity when you get this level of coverage, but in this case, well, this can seriously be questioned, but as a good defense attorney, one could say that when the Royal Oak uh, was launched back in 1972, people also got crazy about it, some screaming at the fact that launching a steel watch in the luxury field of watchmaking was a total heresy. But unfortunately, I don't think you can really compare the two, and this for a number of reasons. Communication, design, branding, product strategy, just to name a few. So first of all, AP kind of went all in with this new collection, teasing us like crazy in the weeks prior to the SHH on social media, and personally I first thought that this name, Code 1159, was actually the name of this teasing campaign, and that at 1159, the day before the opening of the SHH, we would finally discover the new name of this much-awaited collection. So this was my first surprise, and what to think of this name? Who came up with it? Do you really want to boast around and say, hey, look at my code 1159? Well, for me, it simply doesn't make me dream, I must say. Especially that when during the press conference, they tried to make us understand what the letter C-O-D-E stand, uh, stand for, rubbing in your face a marketing message that just leaves me slightly indifferent, and I will spare you what the acronym stands for. But let's now talk about the watch itself, or should I say the watches, since here too they went all in by launching no less than 13 references, and I don't mean 13 variations, but 13 different watches, 3 handles with date, integrated chronograph, perpetual calendar, tourbillon, uh, open work uh, tourbillon, and even a super sonnery minute repeater version. Would a car manufacturer launch all different models of a new car line, like you know, sport version, family version, hatchback, convertible version, diesel, fuel and hybrid versions, you name it. Well, you get my point and I seriously doubt that this would happen. Okay, I understand that AP wanted to send out a very strong message of confidence uh, by doing so, we trust so much what we do that we can do this, uh, but was this really necessary instead of testing the water? Well, my answer is found in the question. AP had already a major statement to be made with the introduction of their first in-house fully integrated chronograph movement, something they had been working on since many years, a movement which probably uh, will be found in Royal Oak soon. So for me this almost suffices to get a strong message out there, uh, onto which you already have a lot to say. It's a real challenge to develop such a movement, it takes years and it took them years, but now this kind of got almost unnoticed and it should be re I mean it should really deserve some proper attention. Actually, personally, I would really love to dig in the details of this development. 
Okay, let's now talk about the design, because uh, this of course sparked a lot of uh, commenting, a lot. In general, I would like to say that AP has spent a lot of efforts with this uh, new collection. They must have spent, I mean, an immense development budget and one can feel it, I mean, uh, but they might have simply overdone things, made it a little bit too complicated. I like the fact that you push the creativity to the limit, uh, but at the end, the overall package must be worth it and ideally harmonious. Again, one can't deny the commitment made, every detail has been really taken into consideration and they can explain and defend every aspect of it. I mean, for instance, uh, this 41mm case, the same for all models presented, with this uh, rather original and complicated shape within a shape. So it must be super difficult to manufacture with all these different angles and the finishing must also take a lot of attention from polished uh, to satiny parts. I mean the extruded lugs that are actually detached, uh, that are actually attached only to the upper part of the case. But to tell you the truth, my first thoughts were, well, can you imagine how much uh, dust will be trapped in there? How difficult this will be to service and repolish? Okay. Well, next design feature with this very special glass reaching the outer limit of the case, something which creates some kind of strange optical illusion because even though the watch is round, well, it can give it some kind of a layered oval shape impression when you look at it with, a, with an angle. And there was for sure some uh, clear intention behind this. Well, there are a lot of these small details like this huge 3D printed logo, lacquered dials, rounded hands, and one definitely feels that there has been a lot of thinking with a lot of technical difficulties to finalize this, but again, maybe just a tad too complicated. Anyhow, during the SIH, this collection was the talk of the show among colleagues and even other brands, but again, I want to be super clear about this, but the market will talk and will decide of its future. On a volume standpoint, AP mentioned to us they would uh, only produce 2000 Code 1159 in 2019. Actually, they were quite in insisting on this point. And these 2000 watches will be part of the brand's overall production of 40,000 watches. But they did mention that in the future, it will probably increase uh, this total production number because 2000 Code 1159 is 2000 less Royal Oaks. And talking Royal Oak, and this was unfortunately uh, totally overshadowed by this launch, but the brand also introduced a new and very cool 38mm Royal Oak chronograph. I mean, it's a perfect size, a real stunner from, uh, for what I'm concerned. It came in four versions, two in steel, two in rose gold, with a choice of white, silver and grey dials. And that was pretty sexy. So sadly, this was uh, AP's last appearance at the SIHH. And here too, one can understand this as AP has started since a few years to internalize as much as possible their retail business in their own stores worldwide. And additional to this, what well, AP is undergoing some uh, serious development of their facility in Le Brassus, in the Vallée de Joux, under the guidance of Danish superstar architect uh, Bjarke Ingels, with the addition of a museum and a super fancy hotel complex, which uh, without doubt they will be able to use to host uh, some private events and future launches. So out goes one of the founding brands of the SIH, but unlike Richard Mille going out in a more like joyful mode, well, I guess AP would have much more preferred to do so with a bit less controversy. But again, let's give it some time, see how the market responds, that's the ultimate judge, and see how maybe they can make this collection evolve slightly, for instance, a bit more readable. But that's just my suggestion. And I must say that unfortunately, and for the wrong reason, well, this has been a rather entertaining uh, event nevertheless. I don't check my Instagram or other social media that often, but this was uh, one heck of a soap opera with all the commenting going on. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. Okay, next brands, and I'll try to be a bit more concise with what will follow. Definitely less controversial, and I will start with Gégère Le Coultre, which introduced a fantastic new Girotourbillon with the Master Grand Tradition Girotourbillon Westminster Perpetual. Yeah, that's the full name. And the brand's first uh, multi-axis tourbillon was actually launched in 2004, followed by the Giro tourbillon in 2008, third iteration in 2013, and the fourth one in 2016. And during these years, Gégère had accustomed us to some pretty sweet, complicated developments such as the Duometre, uh, but they had remained quite silent with these exceptional technical feats over the last few years. So this was a real pleasure to see uh, JLC come with uh, this Jaro 5, and they managed to reduce the size of the three-axis tourbillon, and this uh, results in a rather compact and very beautiful watch, 43 millimeter in width and only 14 millimeter thick. Can you imagine? So this watch holds no less than a four-gong Westminster uh, uh, chiming mechanism and a perpetual calendar. 
On the technical side, one has to add that it uses a constant force and remontoir d'égalité mechanism, and this enabled them to have a jumping minute feature with the clear advantage of preventing any synchronization error with the minute uh, repeater. That's pretty smart. So regarding the perpetual calendar, the date is displayed on the outer part of the dial, and day, month, and year indications are displayed digitally. This watch is really part of the main highlights presented at this year's SIHH, and I'm really happy for Jeger to have been able to come up with such an impressive timepiece. I mean, we could film it only on the very last day of the show, and unfortunately couldn't film it in a chiming action. Uh, the watch had been pretty solicited before, and it shows a bit, and I guess it's still kind of in a prototyping stage since it won't be released before late 2020 or even 2021, and only 18 pieces will be produced. But a good friend of ours, remember the brewers who visited us during the last Basel World, well, they managed to get some footage in action on the first day, so we have proof that it did work at some stage. At Gégé, we also saw three nice new blue watches in the Master Ultra Thin line. Really like this blue enamel dial in these uh, 39mm white gold cases. And they have a moon phase version, a perpetual calendar, and, a f and finally a tourbillon version. Uh, very nice, simple, well balanced, just elegant. Okay, next brand, and let's quickly talk Panerai, which emphasized on the submersible collection with an array of new watches, all water resistant to 300 meters. Personally, I mean, didn't really talk to me, but that's just my own opinion, so who cares? Something interesting to note is that Panerai is, in, is introducing a new experience concept with some kind of very fancy, uh, fancy travel agent services. Uh, so by purchasing some of its limited edition watches, you will be able to participate in some exciting experiences with some of their brand ambassadors, such as uh, swim in the lagoons of Bora Bora, go and train with Italian Special Forces Commando, or wander around in the Arctic. But coming back on the watches themselves, well, Panerai is using more and more its uh, Carbotech material, but also using recycled material. For instance, they are the first to, uh, to use recycled titanium in the Micron Submersible Special Edition. And during the SIH, uh, you know I like sailing, well, they introduced a new partnership with Luna Rossa, the Italian challenger of records of the next uh, America's Cup. And to mark this, they came up with a 47mm model which uses, uses used carbon sails of the Italian outfit as the decor of the dial. I know that for Panerai fans, this coverage will be slightly disappointing, uh, but uh, not much more to say, that's the way it is, and personally, I prefer more classical Panerais. Okay, let's continue, and I'll be short, and I know I've been slightly critical of Mont Blanc over the years, not really understanding the brand's product strategy with such uh, diversified collections and price points, but I have to admit that they now seem to know much more where they are going. They used to have like 12 collections, now will be only four, plus a dedicated woman line, and each line will have three segments. I mean, the first one with watches under five, Five thousand US dollars, approximately, with outsourced movements. One between five and twenty-five, uh, with own manufacturer movements, and one beyond this price point with Minerva movements. So Minerva is uh, being uh, even more integrated to the brand's uh, positioning. But for me, the big question is, I mean, who buys these watches? And don't get me wrong, they have some really nice ones. I mean, these uh, Minerva Mono Pusher Chrono movements are really beautiful. So. Please don't hesitate to tell me uh, your opinion about this. And lastly, uh, for Mont Blanc, well, the color of the year is green, and again, with the extensive use of bronze cases. And bronze cases, well, that now leads me to talk about IWC, as there were quite a few similarities in terms of products with Mont Blanc. Uh, but their main news was the actual revamp of the Spitfire collection, therefore totally normal to see an extraordinary, beautifully looking Spitfire within their booth. I mean, just love this plane, such an iconic plane, fantastic, and actually IWC will be the partner of the world, I mean, of the first round the world trip performed with a Spitfire. The thing strange with this one is that it will go from east to west, from Europe to America and so on, meaning going against the trade winds, uh, making it naturally a bit more complicated, longer, more fuel needed, etc. Et and I asked why, but no one was able to answer me, unfortunately, will remain a mystery, nothing on the website either. 
Concerning uh, these uh, Spitfire watches, you have a 39mm steel or bronze automatic version, a 41mm chrono version, also steel and bronze, and a limited to 271 piece UTC version, 271 being the registration number of the round the world Spitfire plane. Regarding this last one, well the world time mechanism is really easy to use as you simply have to press on the bezel to select the city for which you want the 24 hour disc to display the time. So, I mean really super easy and convenient. In the pilot collection we also saw uh, two new Petit Prince watches, one coming in an exclusive and hard uh, uh, new gold material and featuring for the very first time a constant force tourbillon mechanism and there is also a platinum version both limited to 10 pieces each. Still in the same collection, we also saw a new chronograph with perpetual calendar, this time limited to 250 pieces. All right, next brand and a quick mention of Roger Dubuis, which are really using and taking seriously their partnership with Italian supercar maker Lamborghini. They are leveraging uh, this as much as possible and this is smart of them. Maybe not super original, but smart nevertheless. They introduced a Huracan timepiece uh, with the particularity of displaying a 12 degree inclined tourbillon at 12 o'clock, something which derives from the Quattro timepiece introduced quite some years ago. But the talking piece of the show for them was this one-off project, meaning a radical pièce unique using the multifaceted design features found on some parts of Lambo cars. It holds uh, two inclined tourbillons, uh, a specially developed and patented uh, jumping hour disc. Actually, it's, I mean, it's two discs, one on top of the other, to reduce the space required for, the me uh, for this mechanism, and therefore freeing up a little bit the space available. And a central minute hand and a special selector found at 5 o'clock, enabling to choose which function you want to use with the crown, winding or time adjusting. I guess we'll see some of these uh, elements in future Roger Libri watches, which is really trying to go down the route of Richard Mille, but remember, there is only one Richard Mille. Anyhow, and on the business standpoint, uh, Roger Libri seems to go a bit better than in the past, and we wish them well. Okay, next, and let's talk about Ulysse Nardin, and they also seem to go uh, down a better defined route, bringing in a bit of extra sexiness to the brand, and you'll see uh, what I mean by that later on. So the big novelty for them was the unveiling of the Freak X. The Freak is for sure one of these very iconic watches, but it used to come at a certain price point. So to better exploit this patrimony, Ulysse Nardin smartly introduced a much uh, cheaper version of this watch with the Freak X. And the main particularity of the Freak is that uh, the escapement and balance wheel are actually part of the time indication, rotating uh, in 60 minutes around the center of the watch. But in this new model, no more tourbillons, but nevertheless a flying carousel, and only the balance wheel is in silicon compared to full silicon uh, gear train seen on previous models of the Freak. Actually, I mean, the Freak was the first production watch to present this back in 2001. So this Freak X uh, could be a hit for the brand. I'm really looking uh, forward to see how it will perform in 2019. Uh, but Ulysse Nardin also introduced the Skeleton X, also quite uh, aggressively priced and coming in a revised 42mm case for the titanium, black DLC, titanium and rose gold versions and a 43mm for the version in carbonium, that's a kind of a super light carbon used in aviation. And when I was talking sexiness, what I was referring to a 10-piece limited edition collaboration uh, made uh, with erotic Italian artist Manara and some uh, pretty uh, explicit graphical timepieces, also another way of showcasing Meteda. And I can tell you that this got quite a lot of people talking about it, some being pretty shocked to tell you the truth. Okay, next brand, and off we go with uh, Gérard Perrigo. And here I would just like to mention a special Cosmos tourbillon timepiece, a pretty unusual looking watch, super thick, but still very light, uh, thanks to the extensive use of titanium. And you will find uh, two rotating globes, one with uh, 12 zodiac constellations showing you what you should see by uh, looking up at the sky and the other one working like a time zone indicator. But the brand also presented an evolution of the Laureato with the Laureato Absolute and uh, despite the fact that I do like the Laureato, I must say that this one didn't really appeal to me. But uh, I like the brand and again, I really wish them all the best. Okay, so let's now leave uh, for a little while the big players and I uh, know I didn't talk about Piaget, neither Cartier or Beaumont Mercier, but without being disrespectful, I don't think that there was much to say this year. Not much uh, novelties in terms of creation or innovation, but rather a consolidation of their collection with some variations of existing models. So let's talk about some cool watches seen with the independent and I will start with H. Moser. 
As a quick recall, last year they went full provocative with the Swiss Icon watch and with a video that wasn't really appreciated uh, uh, to accompany this. I mean, made many people laugh, but not some guys from the big brands and their legal departments in particular. So this year they went down the much more politically correct path and they went full green with the uh, Moser Nature Watch. Yes, a bit less risk there and still got a little bit uh, of attention. But then they presented a really super cool timepiece with an evolution of the Swiss app watch. I mean, that's the watch that looks like a bit uh, an Apple watch, uh, but they definitely pushed uh, much further. So to make it simple, this timepiece has no hands, not possible to read the time, but it still gives the time since it, since it is a minute repeater. So you can listen to the time on demand and to, to be classy, well, this is also a tourbillon, the only part of the mechanism you can see from the dial side. So one can ask, how do you set the time without timing? indication. Well, you use the crown to do so, which is engraved with uh, time-telling marks. I mean, that's pretty smart. Yeah, this is a true smartwatch. MBNF didn't really have a new watch to present. They showed the final version of the HM6 coming in a steel execution and also introduced Medusa, a Medusa, a superb table clock developed with Lepe and the glass dome and legs of the beast were executed by the super famous glass makers of Murano near Venice. And you can also actually hang this clock if you want. So, by the way, isn't it incredible in a, the number of times we've had Italian references when you think about it? There must be some kind of magic spell coming from Italy for this SIHH. Bizarre. Well, maybe next year it will be Luxembourg or Liechtenstein. Who knows? Okay, but more seriously, we've seen uh, under the radar something that MBNF will be launching pretty soon. And as they say, it's the bomb! As simple as that. I mean, can't wait to re reveal this later on. Urwerk didn't really have anything new apart from a bronze version of the UR105CT called the Maverick and the finalized version of the AMC, so waiting for Basel to see if there will be some new stuff uh, coming from them. Parmigiani Fleurier had no real novelties either, but also evolutions and personally uh, I really like the toy chronomet uh, introduced a couple of years ago, super elegant watch. But uh, now it comes in uh, with a guilloché slate grey dial with the addition of a double time zone version with retrograde date. Again, elegant, classical, nice. HYT had an evolution of the H0 with a pretty nice uh, gem set version as well as a model with a shattered glass looking dial. Pretty cool. Laurent Ferrier presented a very different type of uh, timepiece with the Ridge 1, something which takes back some of the design features we had seen almost a couple of years ago when the brand collaborated with Ulrich for the only watch caritative auction with the Arpel 1. Ferdinand Berthoud had a variation of their beautiful FB1 tourbillon with fusée chaîne and uh, this time they showcased a very traditional looking gold dial made out of a solid plate of gold, something which takes a huge amount of time to produce and uh, get this kind of nice looking patina. I mean the craftsmanship processes behind it are absolutely incredible and only one small mistake and you just have to start everything all over again. Okay, there were a few other interesting things, of course, but we just didn't have time to shoot this adequately. But now I would like to make a summary of the best and most interesting timepieces according to the Watches TV. Yeah, a bit of subjectivity there. So no particular order in the following choices, but one has to acknowledge that uh, one of the stars of the show was, of course, the Vacheron Constantin Twin Beat. I mean, that's a true innovative timepiece, one that seriously brings a serious uh, added value for the consumer slash collector. Okay, the model we saw was maybe one that was still hot from the oven. And what I mean by this is that I think they can still improve the design of this watch. I mean, I understand that they really wanted to underline the technical achievements uh, of this uh, user-controlled watch where you can actually choose between a, a wearing mode beating at 5 Hz or a passive mode beating at an astonishing low uh, frequency of 1.2 Hz. I mean, giving you this uh, 65 uh, days of power, power reserve. I mean, that's quite crazy. But I think it could be a bit more classical looking uh, according to the brand. And I'm pretty, su pretty sure that uh, we will see this in the near future since it will, be, it will join the, the, the collection of the brand, actually, it's not a one-off. So on the finishing aspect of the watch, I was a bit surprised by the quality of the two balance wheel. I mean, 
it looks simply a bit unfinished. Uh, but let's say that it was kind of a prototype plus. And I'm sure they will fix this because for almost $200,000, well, one is entitled to something a bit more refined, I would say. But nevertheless, a super, super cool watch. Really liked it and very happy for Vacheron. I talked about it before, but obviously the Jeger Le Coup Ultra Gyro 5 is also a favorite. What an amazing machine and just love the compact aspect of it. So a sincere bravo to the JLC team. And even if I understand that they really wanted to make some kind of much needed uh, communication coup, because this watch won't be available for another two years approximately. So I guess there is still a bit of adjusting work ahead of the team, ahead for the team of Le Sentier. Uh, next, and I was particularly impressed by Lange, nothing as spectacular, spectacular as some of their previous launches like, you know, triple split and so forth, but a very strong showing. Just love this new Zeitberg, absolutely gorgeous and bravo, not only for its revised look, but for this totally new movement offering now more than 70 hours of power reserve. And of course, this new date feature, just fantastic. And staying with fantastic superlatives, well, I really love the gold dial tourbillon datograph. Wow, how beautiful can it get? I mean, that's just exquisite. Okay, I mentioned it before, but I really like the new 38mm Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Chrono, but this was definitely overshadowed by what we talked about previously in this showtime, and I hope this will be overcome one way or the other. Really like the Beauvais Recital 26 uh, Sapphire case and to be honest I had a few doubts when I heard that uh, this classical brand was coming up with this uh, but congrats to them. I mean they really pulled it off beautifully and intelligently I must say. The Grebel Force Balancier Contemporain is of course part of my favorite. What a beautiful timepiece, just so elegant, totally in love uh, and I'm pretty sure that it would sit just so perfectly on this wrist. Okay, let me dream a little bit. Oh yeah, it, it, oh yeah, it sits nice. Okay, another timepiece I also really like was the Hermès L'Heure de la Lune. Beautiful design, very clever reinterpretation of the moon phase complication. Playful and superbly executed and very decently priced. And you know that I rarely talk about prices. So feeling really happy for Hermès because I do like this brand and I know that there is still a bit of misconception regarding, regarding their involvement as a serious watchmaker. And I sincerely hope that this, this new timepiece will help them gain the respect that they fully deserve. Great job by the team. Okay, let's now talk about the general atmosphere of the event and by talking with many people, either from the press, uh, brands or retailers, well, the industry is still in a questioning mood despite the 2018 figures being on the upside. So yes, the industry faces challenges, markets still being pulled by uh, Asia in general, and with, with the recent slowdown of the Chinese economy, well, we'll see uh, the, imp the impact of this in the next few months. Attendance of the show was apparently good, more visitors, and the organizers really tried to make it a bit more interactive, more of these talks and conferences, a nice and uh, enjoyed feature, a, de a dedicated space uh, showcasing innovation in watchmaking, and people seemed to really appreciate this. But the show was nevertheless still kind of the same as previous year, but I really have to say that as always, I'm really impressed by the quality of the organization and it's, I mean, it's just a huge lo logistical machine. It's a big, big one. But uh, with the, the much anticipated evolution of Basel World, we will uh, soon see how this will play out for some of the exhibitors present there. Who from the independents will remain? Who will choose to go to Basel World? Well, I was put in the confidence and I have a few answers, but let's wait to make any further announcements. But interesting times ahead for sure, and actually even maybe uh, some new brands participating at SHH, you know, like a transfer from Basel to that. Well, we'll see. Okay, one last thing regarding the format of the show, because as journalists, we are strongly invited to follow the various press conferences held by the brands. And I have to say that uh, this is a rather interesting experience on a sociological level. I mean, they have weeks or even months to get these ready. They often produce pretty cool film to uh, accompany uh, these uh, press conferences. But when brand people actually talk about their new products, I sincerely think they could do things a little bit better, or at least put a bit more enthusiasm while defending their new products. Sometimes you feel they are just simply reciting a speech and there is not much conviction, emotion behind this. And these guys, I mean, they're the brand uh, ambassadors uh, and, and they should seriously do their job, I think, a little bit better uh, with a bit more sincerity and authenticity. 
And again, I would like to point out Hermès uh, because uh, it's actually there the CEO that comes on the stage uh, and he really does the thing right. I mean, humble, no BS, and compared to some others, well, this is really refreshing. And every year, I think the same, unfortunately. And I just hope that most brands could get this exercise right because it's sometimes a bit hurtful for us. So this is it for this rather long edition of Showtime. And to summarize things, we saw a lot of moon phases, a lot of bronze cases, blue and green being the colors of the moment, some very cool and meaningful innovations, and can't wait to see if Basel World will confer confirm these trends. I hope you enjoyed this. Don't hesitate to share your thoughts. Thanks for watching. Thanks so much for our patrons. And viva watchmaking! And remember, time is what you make out of it, regardless of what you do. All the very best and see you real soon.